stakeholders and which would encompass uh, the migration and development component of the other three uh, pillars. And those are all avenues for civil society engagement. And my colleague, uh, Mamadou Diouf from uh, Carita Senegal will talk more in depth about uh, migrant protection uh, later on and how that should be very high on the EU migration and development agenda. On the development side, um, migration has been considered as a priority for development cooperation. There is as well a focus on um, mobility, but mostly on regional um, mobility. And, um, and so the um, EU development policy framework is called the Agenda for Change. And what we saw earlier, so the GAM, both of them have been developed in 2011. Since then, um, there has been a certain evolution uh, aside uh, ahead of the of the TFMD with a new communication being uh, released and such communication has announced a broadening of the migration and development nexus with a series of topics being included and um, while there is a change in this course the change doesn't forcibly take place at the implementing um, level. So while this chart seems to show some kind of evolution which moves from, um, the seems to show some kind of evolution which moves from um, the an approach which would be more focused on the economic and, um, and security lens of the migration and development nexus. Um, I wouldn't talk about a shift in paradigm which would imply a clear cut between the past and the present because uh, what I would like to show actually is that migration, the, the EU migration and development agenda, it's an agenda with a variable content, which content varies across actors but also across implementing instruments and sometimes as well between policy and implementing instruments. So I won't talk, talk too much about uh, the actors. There are um, several ones. Uh, the main ones is the European Commission. And it's, uh, it's a body which actually embodies uh, this tension um, between on home affairs interest on the one hand and development interest on the other hand with um, s different systems of coordination between uh, those, uh, those actors. And I think that civil society has there also a role to play in terms of its advocacy. So civil society acts also as the link between those, um, those different actors and civil society can also assess the impact of this coordination, those different actors and civil society can also assess the impact of this coordination and whether or not it actually contributes to better integrate uh, migration and development. And I will now move to my last point about uh, the implementing instruments. Uh, so implementing instruments are both through funding, and we are all very familiar with that, <coughs> I think, and uh, a series of political and legal instruments. As far as funding uh, is concerned, we see again this tension between home affairs interest on the one hand and development interest on the other hand. On the home affairs uh, side, um, migration and development related projects have been funded, but we must keep in mind that those are all in a sort of, in a sort of territorial continuity of um, the EU's internal uh, priorities. On the development side, um, most migration and development related projects have been funded through the so-called thematic program on migration and asylum. Other um, funding streams are increasingly also funding uh, migration and development. And as civil society, I think that we can uh, both, um, of course, apply for funding, that's one thing. But I think that we also have a role to play in monit monitoring how the money is, um, is, um, is being spent and how those, uh, two, uh, how those uh, opposed interests are um, put together. We also have a kind of cooperation duty within civil society in order to work towards more synergies and um, less duplication, look at uh, projects which have been previously funded and build upon them rather than duplicate them. And, and to finish, I would just like to talk about the legal and political instrument without going so much into details because my colleague, I will, 
from uh, ADPC who will talk more in depth about how ADPC has been involved in um, terms of advocacy, it's in particular with regard to the um, EU Africa strategy. But one of the most important instruments um, within the area of migration development are mobility partnerships. And those are thing are, I think, are the illustration of what I said before, that there is no clear shift in paradigm, but that uh, there is an agenda which varies across um, policies and across actors and across implementing instruments. Uh, while we saw this broadening uh, in discourse with a tendency to move towards a more human development and human rights approach, um, the change seems to be slower at the at the implementing level, uh, and within mobility partnerships, um, the um, the economic and security lens is still still very much present, and um, and this is even more obvious when looking at the actors officially involved in the partnerships, uh, being the council, PG Justice, and um, the rules of the games are very often determined by those who provide funding and those actors are the ones um, who are funding the projects. Uh, in conclusion, so I think that uh, it's a bit hard to summarize the EU, <laughs> the, the EU migration development agenda in five minutes. <laughs> but um, the main thing is that there are multiple actors, multiple sectors, and very often opposed interests. However, I do think that those are also multiple avenues and opportunities for civil society to engage, for concerted action, and not only within civil society working at the EU level, but first of all, across, um, across regions, and that's what we want to show uh, within MAID, and that's what we want to do within the MAID chapter, uh, the MAID Europe chapter. I will now uh, stop here and give the floor to my colleagues um, from uh, ADPC, MFA in Caritas Senegal. And um, yes, and uh, we will start with uh, I will. Yes, I will not introduce you anymore. So yeah. give a Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Awil Mahmoud. I'm the director of the African Diaspora Policy Center based in The Hague. Um, I would like to give you a few uh, comments on the discussion my colleague already started. She gave a very good uh, background, but I would like to add a few uh, ideas. When you talk about migration and development, within the context of Europe, the focus is mainly on management. Migration management is the policy focus, whether it's the at all level. <coughs> migration and development is still not the main focus. And I'm happy also my colleague is also here, he knows very well the debate we have also in Holland, but also in other countries. We did research in 2011 and we discovered 80% of the development aid goes to migration management. It's only 20% set, set aside for development. And that's a challenge, especially for the civil society uh, active in migration and development. From the perspective of ADPC, ADPC is the only African diaspora think tank in Europe created to develop knowledge and advocacy from the perspective of the diaspora. And I would like to share with you some of our experience over the past eight years. Since 2006, we have been trying to do a number of things. One is to influence policy through publications. Policy makers only read documents. So you should produce documents. Otherwise, they will never be convincing. So publication, 
the research from, from the perspective of the migrants is very important. I know the challenge they have because they are not part of the academic institutions. Some of them do not have the tools to develop knowledge. So that challenge is still there. But publication, documentation is one way to influence policy, both at the subnational, national, but also at the EU and also at the global levels. You need to document. One thing we did in 2008 was to organize uh, a workshop in, in Brussels where we invited almost 50 African diaspora organizations from 10 EU countries. That was the first time where the African diaspora groups met uh, their policy makers from their, from their different countries in Brussels. So this kind of face-to-face -face meetings, face-to-face -face engagement also creates some kind of awareness. Finally, they have seen <coughs> the diaspora are important <coughs> actors in development. Another way we try to influence policy is to also um, bring the diaspora <coughs> together, also to build the capacity. Now we have what we call a program called the Diaspora Academy. It's a new program. This is the first program created so far, I know, in Europe. And the whole, <coughs> and the whole idea is to also enhance the capacity of the diaspora who wants to influence policy. Advocacy is a profession. You have to learn. If you want to influence policy, you need to have all the tools, all the know-how to do it. So that program now, it's open, and the diaspora who are focusing on advocacy <coughs> could apply. So then they will come to The Hague, to our center, for one week where they get training how to develop advocacy tools. What's, what's actually important for our this MADE program is that we want to link up experiences, expertise. Of course, what I'm sharing with you is our experience in, in Europe, but there are also experience in, in other regions, in Asia, in Latin America. So we'll, we, 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 we hope in the coming two, three years within this MADE uh, program to also create some kind of advocacy across countries, across continents, because to, to take to this at the national, at the, at the EU level, to the global level, also requires uh, partnership with other uh, stakeholders active in this field. But the main challenge, <coughs> which I raised is <coughs> before, is that <coughs> if most of the countries, most of the rich countries, whether in Europe, whether in, in the US, <coughs> are spending 8% of the development aid to migration management and only 20% on development, then you still have limited access to funding which you could, <coughs> which you could do for your work. So that, that, that will be a really major challenge in terms of raising resources for, for the work we would like to do. Um, as some of my colleagues said today, also this hour, the, the seventh civil society uh, meetings we are having. And my concern still is that we talk, but there, there's, there's limited action. So maybe we also maybe need to look for partnerships to work with the private sector. And my colleague was also raising today, this was a very important issue because sometimes I always say, if you cannot be them, join them. So maybe we have to see one way to work also with other important uh, stakeholders, with the media, uh, with, the, with the local authorities, uh, among others. And um, I just got to this, uh, just give you uh, a short introduction. So maybe I will stop here, and then I will ask my colleagues to continue the discussion. Yeah. You, you didn't tell us about the, the latest development on, on negotiations within, uh, with the ACP. That was the <laughs> issue that we wanted you to talk about. But, okay, maybe we have some time. 
Now let's let's first give the floor to to our to our other speakers. Um, okay, some some perspectives about uh, from from Asia. Okay. Um, hello. Good afternoon. My name is Tatsi Makabuag. I'm from Migrant Forum in Asia. MFA is a regional network of migrant rights advocates, migrant organizations, and grassroots organizations working for the protection of the rights of migrant workers in Asia. Um, we are also a partner of the Mag MAID network. MFA takes the lead in the labor migration and recruitment working group of the MAID network, as well as the Asia working group of um, the MAID network. And within that working group, in the our focus is on recruitment, recruit, looking at recruitment corridors and looking at the different recruitment processes across the globe and how we can surface the different issues in recruitment and also how we can look at good practices in terms of ethical recruitment practices and um, current practices on labor migration and recruitment in different regions and in different corridors of um, labor migration. I was actually reflecting on what I am supposed to say in this um, side event for the past few days because um, it's my first time to attend the official civil society days of the Global Forum on Migration and Development. And for many years, my organization, um, Migrant Forum in Asia, has been organizing parallel events to the GFMD through the People's Global Action on Migration and Development. And um, for us, we, many of our members work on issues of migrant workers on the ground and for us, I, when I was reflecting about this panel, um, we have been, me personally, um, and a lot of the MFA members for the past few days have been sitting in the People's Global Action and looking at the different issues on migration and development that we would like to bring to this global forum on migration and development. And um, since we are talking about development today and in this panel, I think I was just reflecting on some of the messages that I was able to take from the People's Global Action and also some of the um, conversations I've had with a number of people. And I think if we are going to talk about development, I think a civil society, we also need to look at the current crisis in development and the way we look at development and the way states are currently looking at development and looking at migration and development. The existing and um, the existing and the current and dominant development paradigm that states are pushing for treat migrant workers as commodities with very little or no rights. We were talking yesterday about migrants in crisis and um, how we would like to talk about the crisis that migrant workers are going through and I was very struck by one of our partners when he said migrants are not causing the crisis because in many of the discussions of governments, migrants get blamed for the crisis. You see it in the media. You see it in a lot of the a lot of um, um, the discussions that migrants are often blamed for the crisis. What we should be talking about in terms of migrants in crisis is the current crisis of human rights and the migration in migration. There is a crisis in terms of migrant workers are treated as commodities in the discussions of labor and migration and development. There, we've heard today um, in the plenaries about issues of migrant workers here in Europe in the past few days. I have also been listening to the presentations of some of the partners from Europe and talking about issues of the deficit of rights here in Europe. We are here at the Global Forum. We are here at the Civil Society Days. Many of you were also last year at the High Level Dialogue on Migration and Development. We started the High Level Dialogue on Migration and Development last year with a sobering note of 
the government's talking about paying tribute or or to the migrant workers who died at the beginning of the HLD. This year again, we start the GFMD with another news that 40 migrant workers have perished at the borders. We are here in Europe, we are talking to governments and as civil society, I think we need to really think about why we are here, why we are talking about development and if we're talking about migration and development in Europe, has there been any change in terms of our dialogues with member states, with governments on the agenda that we are pushing for? Every time we start um, this international conferences, are we actually creating change? How do we do advocacy? It's been, it, it's, it's like the second global conference where we start the conference with a sovereign note about deaths of migrant workers. Is there any actual change that is happening when we are here, when we sit and talk about um, all of these issues? How do we address these issues? Um, well, I was also uh, reflecting on the Asia and EU labor migration corridor and what some of the reflections from our um, partners in the trade union have said, where here even in, in, in Sweden, there are Asian migrant workers. One of the speakers from um, Saturday from in the People's Global Action talked about um, um, thigh berry pickers here in Europe who initially came um, as under tourist visa and eventually they receive their work permits and many of them are underpaid and they are they incur a lot of debt just to come here to Europe and work as as to work here in in, in Sweden and many of them are abused so while we sit here and talk about these issues is there any real change that's happening and how do we create change I think that's one of the important things that we need to really see when we come to these gatherings and how do we work together and create change on the ground and make differences in the lives of the people that we work for. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's not good. Okay. Merci, je vais parler en français et dire bonjour à tout le monde. Au nom du peuple africain, mais aussi de toute la société de la diaspora africaine dans le monde, je vais juste euh, apporter une petite contribution dans ce débat au nom de Caritas. Donc, ma contribution est une contribution de Caritas Sénégal à cette rencontre qui est membre du MED, euh, MED pour ce que, parce que nous jugeons aussi le, le ventre mou du problème de la migration dans le monde, c'est l'Afrique. C'est l'Afrique, la partie de départ, c'est l'Afrique, la partie de transit, c'est aussi l'Afrique qui aujourd'hui s'interroge dans sa diaspora du comment faire de sorte à apporter une contribution importante pour cette diaspora ici et là pour reconstruire la mer Afrique, le berceau de l'humanité. Dans cette reconstruction et dans cette gestion de la migration, nous avons constaté que l'agenda européen met l'accent particulièrement sur la répression, sur l'embrigadement, sur l'emprisonnement, j'allais même dire. Et effectivement, pour fuir la misère, le mal développement dans les pays du Sud, en Afrique, certains jeunes migrants, du simple fait qu'ils sont partis du principe de ce que disait ce matin notre cousin et frère Djibril Fall, 
la nature a tendance à nous pousser à la, au mouvement. Et ce mouvement est tout à fait naturel. Donc, dans cette logique, ils ont tendance à aller trouver la, chercher la vie ailleurs en espérant de, de la trouver meilleure. Mais ils butent ces hommes et ces femmes, aujourd'hui avec les enfants, butent sur une mesure radicale de répression. Et pourtant, nous sommes dans un contexte, nous dit-on, de mondialisation. De mondialisation où l'argent circule à un rythme cybernétique, mais où on empêche l'homme de circuler à un rythme de liberté. Qu'est-ce qu'il faudrait faire ce qu'il faudrait faire, c'est qu'en tenant compte donc de l'agenda européen qui part sur un principe de répression, d'emprisonnement, etc., nous devions donc essayer de voir comment davantage, à partir des mouvements sociaux, de la société civile, affirmer avec force et respect la nécessité de faire valoir la reconnaissance des droits de l'homme et notamment ceux des migrants en mouvement. Parce qu'il faut toujours se rappeler que ceux-là qui partent, ça pouvait être vous, ça pouvait être moi, ça pouvait être demain mon fils, ça peut être aussi donc après-demain mon enfant. Donc, ils sont souvent à la recherche de conditions de vie meilleures. À Caritas, nous continuons donc à penser qu'il faut inciter les décideurs et les leaders politiques à adopter une démarche visionnaire qui recoupe avec la liberté de l'homme et à investir davantage dans les programmes qui permettent aux populations pauvres ou vulnérables de se développer localement et à sortir du mal développement qui les pousse à vouloir partir à tout prix. Nous pensons aussi avec Caritas, et nous savons que nous le partageons avec beaucoup d'organisations sociales du Sud et du Nord, qu'il faut protéger donc les droits des migrants à une intégration socio-professionnelle afin de leur permettre de jouir de leur pension de retraite quand ils en ont besoin pour ceux-là qui travaillent déjà en Europe et qui ont souvent besoin de retourner en Afrique, dans le Sud, pour bénéficier de leur retraite dans des conditions tout à fait satisfaisantes auprès des leurs. Nous pensons qu'il faut donc renoncer aux politiques répressives et non respectueuses de la dignité humaine. Voilà pourquoi à Caritas, depuis des années, dans ce domaine de la protection des migrants en transit, nous portons notamment l'accent, nous mettons notamment l'accent sur des questions d'accueil et d'écoute. Accueillir et écouter cette personne qui est en détresse. L'écouter pour savoir beaucoup plus profondément ce dont il souffre, ce dont elle souffre. Nous mettons aussi l'accent sur l'orientation et l'assistance médicale mais aussi l'assistance en ville. Nous mettons aussi l'accent sur la mise à disposition d'un logement, quand c'est nécessaire, ne serait-ce qu'un logement temporaire. Mais depuis les dernières années aussi, nous avons vu qu'il y a une vague importante d'enfants en âge de scolarisation qui sont dans les mouvements migratoires. Et là aussi, nous tentons de mettre l'accent sur la scolarisation de ces enfants-là. Nous mettons aussi l'accent sur l'assistance juridique. Quelqu'un a dit tout à l'heure que c'est 80% qui est utilisé par les pays du Nord pour la gestion répressive et policière de la migration et qu'il n'y a que 20% qui pourraient éventuellement aller vers le développement. Ça veut dire donc que s'il n'y a pas une dynamique qui permet d'assister juridiquement, d'assister juridiquement ces migrants pour obtenir pour leur permettre d'obtenir un statut de réfugié, par exemple, ou de se régulariser, comme ils le disent. Il y aura des difficultés. Là aussi, Caritas intervient. Nous intervenons aussi et mettons l'accent sur l'accompagnement d'initiatives économiques qui se prennent dans le cadre d'un retour volontaire. Et ça a souvent aidé à certains, dans les moments les plus douloureux, une fois arrivés dans les premières semaines, dans les premiers mois, de pouvoir au moins avoir un mécanisme souple qui permet d'envisager éventuellement une réinstallation, une réinstallation au niveau local. Nous avons pensé aussi donc ici 
que cette carte illustre éloquemment la situation des migrants de tous les jours et tous les matins sur le continent africain, dans l'Afrique et vers l'Europe, avec des points de départ, mais aussi des points de transit qui les obligent souvent à être à la merci des passeurs, j'allais dire ces passeurs ignobles qui n'en font qu'à leur poche, mais aussi qui semblent être la solution à laquelle les autres s'adoptent parce que les États, au nord comme au sud, les décideurs politiques, au nord comme au sud, n'ont pas pu faire une démarche qui permet d'oublier celle des passeurs. Alors, comment éviter tout cela Comment éviter la continuité des tragédies Ce matin encore, on nous a annoncé 34 migrants qui sont décédés à partir de la Libye parce que leur bateau a fait naufrage. Et là aussi, un ministre libyen nous dit « Oui, nous en avons assez de migrants parce qu'ils amènent la maladie, ils amènent le terrorisme, ils amènent, ils amènent, ils amènent. » Mais bon Dieu, on nous voulons nous demander qui est étranger sur cette terre de Dieu. Il faut donc essayer de voir comment privilégier l'assistance juridique pour éviter les tragédies. Il faut faire donc le plaidoyer ensemble pour la stabilité institutionnelle dans les pays d'origine. Il faut aussi donc sensibiliser sur les dangers de la migration dite clandestine et régulière, mais il faut aussi donc faire le lobbying, le plaidoyer pour trouver, quand il le faut, des familles d'accueil pour un temps et pour que le marché du travail soit ouvert à certains migrants. Faire aussi du plaidoyer pour faciliter l'immigration régulière. Quelle priorité d'action pour nous d'ici la période dite post-2015 Il faut donc sans doute travailler plus en synergie. Et je crois que là, l'exemple du projet MAD pourrait être une piste dans laquelle, sur laquelle on pourrait éventuellement s'appuyer. Travailler donc en synergie en réseaux transnationaux dans un respect de coopération et de solidarité pour affirmer les droits de l'homme à la mobilité et à l'accès aux meilleures conditions de vie. Et surtout quand c'est la vie des hommes, la vie de la personne qui elle-même est menacée. Il nous faut mener ensemble une politique pour déconstruire les politiques répressives et racistes. Nous pensons aussi donc qu'il faut militer pour une vision de l'homme converti à l'amour de tout homme, comme un semblable, un frère ou une sœur, au respect de la dignité humaine et à la justice. Je vous remercie. All right. Pressed for time. Um, it may for you be a little bit chaotic, all these different areas where we have been discussing on. Uh, I think that the point of, of departure uh, when, when talking about uh, European Union migration development, looking at the perspective that the principal uh, objective has been, like has been said by, by several speakers, migration management objectives. So how to channel migration development concerns and human rights within this process is, uh, is an ongoing discussion in which uh, there are avenues opening which are not always very evident. I mean, uh, we have the, uh, uh, for example, the example now is Frontex having opened a uh, human rights consultative forum. So uh, there are sometimes avenues within the existing uh, frameworks that give opportunities, but if we want to do everything at the same time and have a completely open, open borders, uh, I think we lo may lose, uh, although we have to advocate for, for more openings, we may uh, lose some, some of the possibilities we can have already now, like uh, transferability of pension rights, uh, more protection of uh, migrants in transit. Uh, what we look, uh, what we want to do for the coming three years is map more this advocacy, very concrete advocacy possibilities uh, into little pieces and uh, have roundtables with the actors that are engaged. That may not be the Ministry of Interior, 
but it may be, for example, social affairs. Sometimes you have to get the, the correct people at the, at the table. Uh, we are pr getting pressured for time now. Um, it was just a very short idea on what type of discussions we want to open. Um, <laughs> Is the article, the, 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 yeah, the, 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 the next panel is already starting, so I'm afraid that we, one question, one question, two, oh. <laughs> oui, bien sûr. Ok. Alors, la deuxième remarque, c'est que je crois que depuis le temps que je participe à ce GFMD, ça fait bientôt la quatrième année, on est en train de laisser en rade une bonne partie des gens qui ne sont pas des migrants, mais qui sont issus de la migration. Je veux parler des, des enfants qui sont nés dans les pays d'accueil et qui pouvaient donner une nouvelle perspective à notre processus. Et souvent, je n'ai jamais rencontré un groupe de secondos ou un groupe de, de, dans, ces, dans ces rencontres. Et ceux-là, ils n'ont pas besoin d'être empowered ou quelque chose comme ça, parce que la plupart du temps, ils sont nés ici, ils ont grandi ici, ils ont donc des, des, des outils qui pouvaient, nous, euh, qui pouvaient nous aider dans notre dynamique. Alors, qu'en est-il de ces gens-là Comment les impliquer Merci. Malheureusement, euh, on, on a le, le prochain panel qui va commencer, mais j'aimerais bien qu'on peut continuer pendant le, le coffee break. Uh, during the coffee break, we can continue our, our, our conversa conversation, because otherwise the whole program will be delayed. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>